الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so as I had discussed last time إن شاء الله تعالى we will begin with the next batch of Sahaba and as I had said we are not doing a history of the Khulafa al Rashidun in the year after them rather what we're doing is the lives of the Sahaba and so we now move on to another Sahabi and the Sahabi we're going to do today is actually one of the promised ten one of the Prashara Mubashara now before we jump into his biography I thought it's useful to remind ourselves and to learn and to study what is this concept of Ashara Mubashara? Where do we get it from? Why do we say that some of the Sahaba are Ashara Mubashara? And what is the evidence for this? Now, uh, realize that uh, the fact of the matter is that the Quran and Sunnah is full of uh, Tabshir. Tabshir is good news, right? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a Mubashiran wa Nadira. So, Mubashir is the one who brings good news. And the Prophet ﷺ gave glad tidings, gave good news to, uh, to many categories of people. And the good news here is the news of Jannah. There's only one news that is so good that qualifies the Prophet ﷺ to be Mubashir. The biggest, best news is that of Jannah. And so the Quran has وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ right? وَبَشِّرْ this, وَبَشِّرْ that. And the Hadith as well has categories of uh, Bashara, of good news. So for example, who can give me any Hadith that has Bashir so and so? Any Hadith. Give, give, give glad tidings to. No, uh, categories of people. Categories. I gave him quite a few of them in the Khatiras, in Ramadan especially we gave. One of the main ones I always emphasize is بَشِّرِ الْمَشَّائِنَ فِي الظُّلَمِ بِالنُورِ التَّامِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ Give glad tidings to those who walk to the masjid in dark, i.e. who pray Fajr and Isha. So there's بَشِّرِ, give glad tidings. Our Prophet as well said, بَشِّرِ, give glad tidings to those who say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ from their hearts, that they're going to enter Jannah. And our Prophet gave glad tidings to those who love one another for the sake of Allah. So these are all categories. But what we're interested in is, where did the Prophet give Bashara to specific Sahaba? Where did he give good news to specific Sahaba? So there are many Sahaba who have been promised paradise even while they are alive. And there are 10 who have a special status. Now let me repeat that. There are many Sahaba who have been promised paradise while they were alive. How many? More than 10. More than 10. And of course, it depends on which hadith is sahih or not, but definitely at least around 15 or so we know for sure have been promised paradise while they are alive. But then there are 10 that are considered to be ashara mubashara. Why, when more than 10 have been promised paradise, are only 10 called ashara mubashara? Do you understand the question? Right? Why is it that these ten have a special category? Well, they are considered to have a special category very simplistically because they are all mentioned in hadith by name, ten beginning to end. Okay? So in a number of traditions, these ten are marked out and the others are not mentioned. So because of this, they are considered to be the Ashar Abu Bashar. And I'll quote you only two of them. The first of them is Sunan At-Tirmidhi or Jam'a At-Tirmidhi, Hadith number 3747. So uh, from uh, Sunan At-Tirmidhi or from Jam'a At-Tirmidhi, that uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, so this is the hadith, okay, listen to me now. This is straight from uh, uh, the chapter of the blessings of the Sahaba in Sunan At-Tirmidhi. So, Abdul Rahman bin Awf reported that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Abu Bakrin fil Jannah, wa Umar fil Jannah, wa Uthman fil Jannah, wa Ali fil Jannah, wa Talha fil Jannah, wa Zubayr fil Jannah, wa Abdul Rahman ibn Awf fil Jannah, wa Sa'ad fil Jannah, wa Sa'id fil Jannah, wa Abu Ubaida, Amir ibn Jarrah fil Jannah. Exactly. 10. Do I need to translate that or it's pretty clear? Okay? Each one of these 10, fil jannah, fil jannah, fil jannah, fil jannah. End of hadith. So this is a hadith. And so in this hadith, quite literally, exactly 10 uh, sahaba are mentioned. Exactly 10 sahaba are uh, mentioned. And we have another hadith reported uh, by uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Asharatun fil jannah. This is the hadith, another hadith reported by another sahabi, right? Asharatun fil jannah, 
10 are the people in Jannah. But this hadith has a slight difference. He said Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, uh, Zubayr, Talha, Abdurrahman, Abu Ubaidah, Sa'ad ibn Abi, Abi Waqas. Uh, and then uh, he counted all of these. Uh, and then he was silent on the 10th one. So they said, we ask you by Allah, who is the 10th one? Tell us who the 10th one is. So then the narrator is Sa'id ibn Zayd. He said, uh, the next one is Abu Al-A'war. And Abu Al-A'war is the father of uh, the one who has yani, uh, basically not one eye is missing, let's say. Okay? Uh, uh, and he meant by this is himself. Sa'id ibn Zayd is the 10th of the 10. Sa'id ibn Zayd is the 10th of the 10. And he didn't want to give the name of the 10th. So he stopped at 9. Then they said, we ask you by Allah, you said 10, where is the 10th? Then after a while he said, the 10th one is Abu Al-A'war, meaning he's trying to deprecate himself, he's trying to put himself down. Like, I don't deserve to be in this, but the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, you know, uh, Abu Al-A'war, or, you know, and that's he, his own kunya, Sa'id ibn Zayd, is in uh, Jannah. So these are two hadith in Sunan At-Tirmidhi, another, another beautiful hadith in Mustadi Muhammad as well, uh, volume 3, page 165. Uh, where we have a similar hadith, but it has a, a longer story to it. It has a longer story to it. Uh, that uh, hadith number 1630. Hadith number 1630. That Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba uh, was sitting in the big masjid of Basra. Mughira ibn Shu'ba was in Basra. Uh, uh, sorry, in Kufa. It's not Basra, Kufa. Mughira was in Kufa. And he had the people around him in the grand masjid. So Mughira was appointed the governor of Kufa uh, and he was basically in the sitting in the majlis and a man came and sat down in front of Al-Mughira but Al-Mughira put him up close to him and this is Sa'id ibn uh, uh, Zayd uh, ibn Amr ibn Rufayl Sa'id ibn Zayd is the last tenth of the ten and while they were sitting there a person began to uh, curse Ali ibn Abi Talib so this is during the reign of uh, during the reign of the, the fitna between uh, Muawiyah and after that, uh, during the time of Muawiyah as well. As we know, some of the Bedouins and some of the uh, people began to hate on Ali ibn Abi Talib. So in front of Al-Mughira, somebody begins to say bad things about Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this uh, person, who is of course Sa'id ibn Zayd, said, aren't you hearing what he is saying? Somebody is cursing Ali and you do not respond back to him? You do not respond back to him. So if you're not going to say something, I'm going to say something. I swear that I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, and my ears heard it and my heart memorized it. So he is now making a, a qasim here. I know what I heard, my ears heard it and my heart uh, memorized it. And I would never lie about the Prophet ﷺ because my Lord will ask me when I met him. So he is now giving so many uh, building up that I'm not going to lie. That he said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, and Umar fil Jannah, and Ali fil Jannah, and Uthman fil Jannah, and Talha fil Jannah, Zubair fil Jannah, Abdurrahman fil Jannah, wa Sa'ad ibn Malikin fil Jannah. And the ninth one of the believers, if I wanted to mention his name, I would mention him. him. Uh, and they said, tell us who is the, the, that person, tell us who is that person. Uh, and so he said, I am that tenth person, or I am the last person that was uh, mentioned. So, uh, and this is Sa'id ibn Zayd, he was, as we said, humble to not put himself. He said, if I wanted to, I could tell you. Then they said, no, tell us, tell us, tell us. So then he basically said that, okay, I am that person uh, of them. So these hadith all put together, narrated by multiple sahaba, explicitly indicate what? That the Ashara Mubashara have been mentioned by name one after the other in one hadith. So, therefore, as far as I'm aware, there is no ikhtilaf who these ten are. These ten unanimously agreed. Who are they? So please now, one of the things I request all of you to memorize Ashara Mubashara. Right? Just like yani we should memorize the famous battles, we should memorize, so it is not befitting that we don't know the Ashara Mubashara of the uh, Sahaba. Okay? So, number one, everybody knows. Abu Bakr, two, three, four, we know, okay? Umar, Uthman, Ali, okay? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Uh, the, the, then after this, there's no tartib per se. There's no like order in hierarchy. These four, their order is because of their khilafah. So we know their order. And as we said, Ali and Uthman radiallahu anhum, they're very close to one another. And so some people from early Islam would prefer Uthman 
Ali, Ali over Uthman, but then eventually the bulk of the majority they said Uthman over Ali, and the point is that we're very close to one another. But the rest of the six, there's no specific tartib, okay? So, however you memorize them, it is fine, and they are Talha and Zubayd. You can remember Talha and Zubayd that they both died in the Battle of the Camel. So just remember like this, Talha and Zubayd, they are together, they were fought on the side of Aisha in the Battle of the Camel. So there we have five and six, Talha and Zubayd. Then we have Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And Abu Ubaidah Amid ibn al-Jarrah, that's seven and eight. So, Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Abu Ubaidah Amid ibn al-Jarrah. And then the last two, just memorize Sa'ad and Sa'id. Sa'ad, which one? Ibn Abi Waqqas. And the tenth one that most people don't know, and they haven't thought about, and they don't really know even, is Sa'id ibn Zayd. And of course, that's why we're here. Inshallah, we'll have a class on Sa'id ibn Zayd. And who is he? Uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Abdul ibn Ufayl. Uh, he is the tenth one. Sa'id ibn Zayd. Okay, and he's the one who narrated this hadith that I am that tenth one, uh, and I'm. You know, he didn't want to uh, to to put it out like this. Okay. So once again, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Talha, and Zubair. Right. Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Right. And then uh, Abu Ubaid, Amid ibn Jarrah. And then Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and then Sa'id ibn Zayd. These are the ten Ashara Mubashar. Now, one point about them. They are all from the Quraysh. They are all from the Quraysh. Okay? Why do you think this is the case? Not because of Astaghfirullah Asabiya or, or tribalism, but because what they did in Mecca, nobody could make up in Medina. What they did in Mecca, and the trials that they had to undergo, and the torture and the efforts that they did, and their dedication and loyalty, nobody could come close to that, no matter how much they did in the Medinan phase, right? As Allah says. The ones who won are early, they're the ones who are the first. The sabiq is the awwal, the sabiq is the ones who are the first, meaning in time. Al awwal means they won the race, they're, the, they're in the front. As sabiqoon al awwalun. They are the ones who are basically going to go to the highest. So all of them are from the Quraysh. Now very quickly, uh, just to give you a tidbit about their genealogy and whatnot. So the Quraysh, as we know, is many sub-tribes, right? Who amongst these ten is the closest in lineage to the Prophet Wasallam? Everybody should know. Ali, Ali radiallahu anhu, right? Obviously. And Ali is the only Hashimi from these ten. Ali is the only... Hashimi from these ten. Then the next uh, close in uh, in kin is Zubair. Zubair ibn Awam. And Zubair is from the tribe of uh, Banu Abdul Uzza. And in fact from his uh, 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 mother's side, his paternal aunt I should say, sorry. So his father's sister. His father's sister is Khadija. Okay. So his aunt, Zubair's aunt is Khadija. Okay, but obviously that's not a blood lineage. That's a lineage by marriage. That's not a blood relationship. It's a relationship by marriage. So Zubair uh, is from the tribe of Banu Abdul Uzza, and he is the next uh, closest in kin. Then the next is Uthman ibn Affan, and Uthman ibn Affan is from the tribe of Banu Umayyah, as we know. And the Banu Umayyah joins with the Prophet after four generations. Okay, then the next are two people. They are both exactly the same, five generations between him them and the Prophet and that is Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Abdurrahman ibn Auf. They are both from the tribe of the Banu Zuhra. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Abdurrahman ibn Auf. They are both from the tribe of Banu Zuhra. But Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas has a double relationship. So from the father's side, which is how Islam calculates Nasab, right? From the father's side, yes, five generations. But Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is a first cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Amina. So Amina's brother is Sa'ad's father. Clear? So, Amina is also from the tribe of the Banu Zuhra. Amina, binti Wahab, right? So, Wahab, this Wahab is Sa'ad's grandfather. Amina binti Wahab, okay? Wahab is Sa'ad's grandfather. And so, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, their first cousins with the Prophet But not from the father's side, from the mother's side, Amina's side. Okay, from Amina's side, he is the first cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the next uh, group of people is the Banu Taym, 
the, the category of Banu Taim, the, the tribe of Banu Taim, and there are two of these six from the tribe of, there are two of these ten from the tribe of Banu Taim. Who is the first of the Banu Taim, guys? Abu Bakr, at taimi Abu Bakr, at taimi Abu Bakr is from the Banu Taim. Abu Bakr, and can you remind me how many generations do they match up with the Prophet? Very good, six. Abu Bakr and the Prophet, six generations. Okay, that's Banu Taim. And Abu Bakr has a cousin, a second cousin, and that is Talha. Talha, and that's what we're going to talk about today, by the way. Talha and Abu Bakr are basically uh, children of cousins, so they're second cousins. So their fathers are first cousins, their grandfathers are brothers. Simple. So Talha's father's father and uh, Abu Qahafa's father, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Qahafa, uh, they are full brothers. So these are two brothers, their grandsons. So, uh, and obviously, by the way, even now to this day, we know who our cousins and may, many times we know our second cousins. In Jahiliyyah and pre-Islam and in early Islam, this means everything. This means everything. You are defined by your cousins and second cousins. You know exactly how you're related to everybody else. So these are very important factors for early Islam. So the Banu Taim have two, and that is Abu Bakr and Talha. Then after them are another two, and they're also related together, and that is the Banu Adi. And the Banu Adi is Umar ibn Khattab, Banu Adi. And how many between him and the Prophet Sallam? When do they combine? Eight. Eight. The Banu Adi eight between uh, Umar and the Prophet go back eight generations you get the same person okay so we're going back and at least 300 years or so and that becomes the Banu Adi and uh, Umar ibn Khattab is from the Banu Adi and Umar's brother uh, Umar's uh, sorry Umar's uncle has a son and that is Zayd and so Zayd Ibn uh, uh, Zayd ibn uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd excuse me Sa'id ibn Zayd uh, they are Cousins to Umar ibn al-Khattab. So, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd and Umar ibn al-Khattab are both from the Banu Adi. Uh, so, let me just clarify. Uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd. Zayd and Umar are cousins, first cousins. So, Sa'id is one level below. Okay. Zayd, his father, and Umar are first cousins. So, Sa'id is the younger. He's the youngest of these ten as well, by the way. So, he is the uh, one level below Umar. One level, so between him and the Prophet is nine people because he has an extra person there. Uh, but his father uh, is the famous, Sa'id ibn Zayd's father is the famous Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl whom we began the seerah with five years ago. The first or second, not the first lecture, the second lecture was all about Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Remember or anybody remember Zayd ibn Amr or we are completely forgotten? One person remembers, alhamdulillah. Okay, that's good, alhamdulillah. Okay, and then there's one left. And that is the furthest person, and that is Abu Ubaid Amr ibn al-Jarrah. And basically his tribe is, his sub-tribe is the furthest sub-tribe from the Banu Hashim out of all of the Quraysh. And in fact, they only meet together at Quraysh directly. So they go back, uh, I think, 10 or 11 generations. So Abu, Abu Ubaid Amr ibn al-Jarrah is the farthest in terms of Nasab. But they're all uh, Qurashi. Now, we said these are the 10 that have been mentioned in a hadith and therefore they get a special status. Okay, are they the only that have been pa promised paradise? No. Who can tell me other Sahaba whom the Prophet said as they're alive, they're still alive. Who can tell me other names that the Prophet said to them something that indicates they're people of Jannah? Number one, Bilal. What did he say to Bilal radiallahu an? So I heard the flip-flop of your yani footsteps, the slapping sound of your footsteps in Jannah. Which means Bilal is of the Mubasharun bil Jannah, but he's not of the ten. Okay? Because the hadith says, Asharatun fil Jannah. Then it mentions ten. So Bilal is of the elite of the Sahaba. But he's not of those ten. Clear? Okay, so that's definitely one person. Who else was told that he would be a person of Jannah? Very good. Al Yasir, right? May Allah make my family as well from the people of Jannah, inshaAllah. But the real Al Yasir, not this Al Yasir. Al Yasir, Sabran Al Yasir, Fa inna mawidakum al Jannah, right? Be patient, O family of Yasir, for verily your place is in Jannah. And that's Al Yasir, so that's Yasir and Sumayya. And then who else is included in Al Yasir? Ammar. And Ammar has a double, he has a double privilege. 
Ammar ibn Yasir has a double privilege. Not only does he come under sabr and ala Yasir, but there's another hadith about Ammar. Right? That you're going to die a shaheed and the, the Baghiya group is going to kill you. Right? So there's another blessing in that one, even though that one is not explicit about Jannah. But it's still an indirect blessing that you're going to die a shaheed. And when the Prophet says that, then what does that mean? So it's like one plus one equals two. He didn't say directly to Ammar, other than Sabr and Ali Asr, but the point is when you get that prediction, what does that imply? It implies basically uh, Jannah. So we have Ammar ibn Yasir, who else was given, and, uh, and, and Ali Yasir, who else was, was given the good news of Jannah? Who? By name, who? Which one? How? Where? What? Give me a name. So, you know, you have four. But where? Where? Okay, so th that's good, but there's a more explicit hadith. There's an even more explicit hadith. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet is in Mecca. And he's with, sitting with Khadija. And he says to Khadija, Jibreel has come to me to give salams to you from your Lord, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to give you glad tidings of a house in Jannah, in which there is no tiredness and no noise. Okay? The hadith is in Bukhari. So this is, this is good news for Jannah. Khadija explicitly got told, you're getting into Jannah. Okay? Who else? Fatima, indirectly, yes, that is true. Very good, Hassan and Hussein. Hassan and Hussein, the both of them. The hadith says, Hassan and Hussein, Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah, wa Abuhuma Khairam Minhuma. Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, are the leaders of the young men of um, Jannah. Uh, so, and uh, we, the, so we can also add Ukkasha ibn Mihsan, the famous hadith narrator of the Sahaba, the famous hadith of 70,000 entering Jannah without hisab. The Prophet said, 70,000 of my ummah will enter Jannah without hisab. Ukkasha said, Ya Rasulullah, Make dua that Allah makes me amongst them. So the Prophet said, you are amongst them. Then another man stood up and said, make dua as well for me. And the Prophet said, Sabaqaka biha ukkasha. Ukkasha was the first that said, I can't keep on opening this door. Okay. So Ukkasha has been told, you are amongst them. So that's another person. And there are maybe a few others that are. That are. Now, there are quite a few who when they died, their families were told that they are in Jannah. Okay? There's a big difference between being told yourself and then you've moved on and their families are told. Some examples of this one. Just, just to... Hamza, very good. Sa'ad, very good. Sa'ad ibn Malik, very good. Who else? Mus'ab ibn Umair, very good. Who else? Ja'far. Ja'far, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, right? Ja'far, he went to the house of Ja'far, remember? He rubbed the, the, the yatim of Ja'far and he said, Allah has given your father wings instead of his arms in Jannah, right? So we have Ja'far as well. Um, Jabir ibn Abdullah was told his father, Abdullah ibn Haram, uh, is in Jannah. So Jabir was told he was very sad. His father had died. He had left like seven sisters, no brothers. So he has seven sisters to take care of and no brothers. And uh, uh, he was very, very distraught. And the Prophet consoled them and said, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to your father without any veil between them. And he said to them, this, so the hadith is also there. So the point being many, um, many people uh, beyond the ten, many people have been told. Uh, and we know at least five or six that have been told. And then many people have been told after they die, the rest of the Sahaba are told. Especially Shaheed, by the way. A number of Shaheeds in Badr, Uhud, whatnot, we come across. Even the Yahudi that died the day of Uhud, right? He didn't even pray one salah. And the Prophet told us he's in Jannah, right? So he accepted Islam and he fought and then he had dakhla Jannah. He didn't even pray salah salat and qat. He didn't pray any salah and he got into Jannah. So those that are told Jannah uh, after they have gone to other family members or to the Muslim community is more than Ashara. There's more than the ten. But those that are, as we said, the ten are indeed the, the highest of the high. And that's why we call them Ashara Mubashara because of these hadith. Simple as that. Asharatun fil Jannah. So these are the Ashara Mubashara. But please understand there are more than ten. Okay, Tayyib. Um, the the 
It doesn't say they will be in Jannah. It does not say that they will all be in Jannah. Not at all. Rather, it gives them good news. The best army is this or that. It doesn't say they will be in Jannah. So they are a good army. It does not mean each and every one amongst them uh, is automatically going to enter Jannah. It's just a blessing that the Prophet is giving to that entire army. Tayyib, so today inshallah ta'ala with that long introduction because we needed that because now for the next few weeks we'll be doing the rest of the six, right? So today inshallah we'll finish up one of the six. Now obviously because none of these other six really held positions of political power, they weren't prominent politically, so the ma'lumat, the, the, the knowledge about them is much less compared to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum. And we will see this when we get to the later sahaba, we might even combine two or three sahaba in one lecture. That's all we know about them. So subhanAllah, we just know their name and biography and basic things. So today, inshallah, I will choose the uh, fifth of them. And that is Talha ibn Ubaidullah, who is typically mentioned as the fifth of these. Even though we said there's no actual tartib. But if we were to posit a tartib, no doubt Sa'id ibn Zayd will be the last because there is the least knowledge about him. And because as well, he was the youngest really of the ten. So, uh, even though they're all Ashna Bashara, but still there's no And then as for the fifth, if we had to put somebody, then uh, uh, يعني, Talha and Zubayr, the both of them really are together. And they're always mentioned together. Talha and Zubayr are also very good friends together. So today we'll do Talha, and inshallah next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala, we will do a Zubayr uh, ibn al-Awwam. So, Talha ibn Ubaidillah. Talha ibn Ubaidillah, uh, his full name very quickly is Abu Muhammad Talha ibn Ubaidillah ibn Uthman ibn Amr ibn Ka'b ibn Sa'ad ibn Taym ibn Murra ibn Ka'b. Murra ibn Ka'b is where it meets with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one of the very interesting things about Talha was that he was one of the very few people whose mother also converted to Islam and also performed the hijrah with him. So Talha uh, got the blessing of having his mother convert to Islam and she performed the hijrah and she passed away and we don't know anything else about her other than that one little tidbit. Now Talha has many blessings, many fada'il. Firstly, he is of the ten who are promised paradise. Secondly, he is of the first ten to convert to Islam. In fact, he is the eighth to convert to Islam. The eighth person to convert to Islam is Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And thirdly, he is one of the famous five who converted at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Okay, so Abu Bakr as-Siddiq gave da'wah as soon as he became Muslim. And five people converted at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And they are essentially all of them, Mubasharun bil Jannah. So Zubair converted at the hands of Abu Bakr. Talha. Right? Uthman ibn Affan and Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas and Abdurrahman ibn Auf and all of these are Mubashara bil Jannah. So subhanAllah Abu Bakr is quite literally yani Allah Azza wa Jal blessed him to bring five of the best Sahaba of the Prophet to Islam. SubhanAllah, what an amazing blessing. Right? So Talha is one of those that Abu Bakr gave uh, da'wah to. And of course, of the blessings of Talha as well, is that he was one of the six. What six? What six? One of the six at the death of Selection Committee. Khilafah Selection Committee. Right? Umar ibn Khattab Selection Committee. He's one of the six. So these are all very elite categories and he's in every single um, one of them. And there are a number of uh, yani blessed uh, uh, blessings mentioned in the hadith. Of them, we just mentioned two of them. The Ashram of Bashar hadith, obviously he's in it. Of the ahadith uh, that are mentioned about Talha, uh, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that uh, Talha is of those who mimman qada nahbahu. Now this is a Quranic phrase. Surah Al-Ahzab فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ There are some of the Sahaba who have fulfilled their covenant with Allah. And there are others who are waiting to fulfill it. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ So this is a Quranic phrase. And the Prophet once pointed to Talha and he said, This person is of those, Talha is of those who have قَضَى نَحْبَهُ He has fulfilled his Promise to Allah and pass the test. In other words, he's basically being told, you pass the test. He's being told. So that's one of the ways of, of uh, Bushra as well. It is also mentioned in the hadith in Musadraq of Al-Hakim that one day during, uh, uh, some say it is during the time of um, uh, Ahzab, some say it is during other times where there was a severe, uh, severe drought and people were hungry uh, and there was no food, that Talha 
was so generous that he slaughtered a camel when they most needed it because camels are very precious and you don't slaughter them for meat unless it's a very big occasion. So during this occasion he slaughtered a camel and he in fact uh, dug a well to find water for the Prophet ﷺ and then he invited him to a feast because they were very hungry at the time. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Talha al-Fayyad, Talha, the one who is overflowing with generosity. So that is one of his nicknames, al-Fayyad with the dad, al-Fayyad. Fayda, yani fada yafudu is to overflow. So Al-Fayyad, the one who is overflowing with generosity. And we will see throughout his life that Talha was very, very generous. It is rare to find such a Sahabi. And of the blessings of Talha mentioned in the Hadith, uh, it is authentically narrated that uh, the Prophet ﷺ predicted that Talha would die a shaheed. It is narrated in Sahih Muslim that one day outside of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was walking outside of Mecca and they were walking uh, on Ghar Hira, Mount of Hira. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said to Hira, this hadith, by the way, has been narrated in the Uhud as well, Uthbut Uhud. And it's mentioned Uthbut Hira. So there are both two separate instances. And in this hadith, we don't have in the Uhud one, by the way, who was it? Abu Bakr Umar. The Prophet Abu Bakr and Umar. Right? In this hadith, which is in Mecca, uh, there was in fact. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Zubair, Sa'ad, and Talha. Okay? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and uh, Zubair, Sa'ad, and Talha. So he had seven of the Ashara. And the Prophet said to Hira, but it does not mention that Hira was shaking in this version. Yeah, the Prophet said to Hira, Be firm, O Hira, because you have on you a Nabi, a Siddiq, a Shaheed, and nothing else. You only have Nabi, Siddiq, or Shaheed in this combination. And so, obviously, Talha is of the uh, Shuhada. And as well, it is narrated in Sahih Bukhari that when Umar radiallahu an was stabbed and he was about to die, he chose the six and then he said that these are the six Tawfi and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam wa hum anhu radin. That the Prophet passed away and he was happy with these six. So Umar is saying that these six people, the Prophet was happy with them. Okay, so that is another blessing that. A Sahabi is testifying that the Prophet is pleased with Talha when he passed away. According to most reports, Talha was born around 28 years before the Hijrah, which means he embraced Islam at the very young age of 15. So Talha embraced Islam as a 15-year-old uh, young teenager. And uh, one of the earliest uh, historiographers of Islam, Ibn Manda, who wrote a book about the Sahaba, he says that Talha was brownish in complexion with a lot of hair like going down, uh, very handsome, shorter height, not very tall, shorter than usual with broad shoulders. And this is what we'll get also a brownish complexion, uh, which is the standard complexion of the Arabs at the time. Now Ibn Sa'ad mentions that something happened to him before his conversion, um, and that is that he was in the markets of Basra, not Basra, Basra, we said many times, not Basra of Iraq, Basra of Syria, right, Basra of Asham. And he was in the marketplace because he and his father were both businessmen. And he would go and uh, buy and sell, and they were from a very wealthy family. Talha was from a wealthy family, and he remained wealthy for his entire life, as we will come to. So the, uh, he was in the marketplace of Basra, and the, uh, he found a monk there asking, is anybody from... Mecca, is anybody from Mecca? So Talha said, I am from Mecca. So the monk said, has Ahmed appeared yet? So Talha said, who is Ahmed? So the monk said, a prophet is going to come, his time has come, and he will appear from your land. So Talha went back, and that is when he heard that the Prophet had begun preaching, and he met Abu Bakr, and then the conversion happened. Okay, so it, this is also mentioned, and as we know, these types of things have been mentioned many times in the seerah uh, about uh, such uh, stories. And uh, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, uh, the Prophet wasallam, made him a brother to Zubayr ibn Awam even in Mecca. If you remember, we mentioned this very early on, that the Mu'akha, it took place twice, once in Mecca and once in Medina. So even in Mecca, there was a Mu'akha. Amongst the early Muslims, like people are made brothers. And then in Medina it was done again. People are made brothers again. So in Mecca, the Prophet made Zubair and Talha uh, brothers. And um, when the Hijrah took place, when the Hijrah took place to Habasha, to Abyssinia, 
Talha had no need to go because he was a very respected member of the Quraysh. And there was no problems with him being a Muslim, with his Banu Taym. And who else was from Banu Taym? Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr also, did he go to Habasha? No. The Banu Taym, they were not as crude or as harsh as some of the other tribes. And they did not persecute their converts. So look at how Qabali it is, right? Look at how tribal it is. The depending on your tribe, then. And Abu Bakr, when was he harmed the most? When he physically attempted to defend the Prophet ﷺ. Then he got involved. Otherwise, as a Taymi, he was not harmed. And Talha, we don't read of any actual persecution done against Talha. Because, number one, he was from a... Uh, the tribe of Taim, number two, he himself was socioeconomically, his father was wealthy. And you know, when you're wealthy, you get privileges. This is the reality of the world that we live in. When you have that money, that, that you get those perks. And his father was a wealthy man, and Talha obviously is also involved in the trade. So it does not appear that we don't really find that Talha face the type of persecution that the physical persecution that some of the other early Muslims were not from the Quraysh uh, faced. And that's why, by the way, look at who were the people that were suffering the most, the non-Qurashi and especially the non-Arabs. Especially the non-Arabs. Okay? Such as Bilal. Such as Sumayya. She wasn't an Arab and she was the first Shahida. She wasn't an Arab. And Yasir was technically an Arab, but you know how their Unsuriya and their Jahiliya was? He was from the lowest Qabil of Arabs, very low class of Arabs, so he wasn't considered to be a, a high stock of the Arabs. And so there was no problem getting rid of him and, and killing him as well. And Ibn Mas'ud was also yani, harassed and intimidated and he wasn't from the higher. So you get the point here. As for Talha, nothing because he is from the Banu Taym. And he had that element of Izzah that he wasn't physically harmed as much as we as much as we know as far as we know and in fact it is even narrated that so he did not migrate to Habasha and when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina he was in fact at that time on an expedition in Syria so what this indicates is that he is still buying and selling as a Muslim and he's not getting that type of persecution that uh, some of the other Sahaba had. And this is subhanAllah, dhalika fadlullah, that's Allah blessed him, that his tribe was more cordial and, and, and accepting than other sub-tribes. So he didn't have that type of persecution that the others did. So in fact, he's actually in, in uh, Syria. And it is said that on the way down, when he passed by Medina, he heard that the Prophet is coming to Medina. But he didn't get him in Medina. Then he met Abu Bakr and the Prophet outside of Medina by a day or two. So he met them on the way down. Now that they're so far away, so they're not hiding anymore, they're rushing to Medina. So Talha tells them that the people of Medina are waiting for you. The people in Medina are waiting for you. And according to Ibn Ishaq, uh, Talha actually gifted uh, the Prophet of Abu Bakr new garments that he just got from Syria. So gifted them good looking garments so that they can enter Medina. So Talha is the one who gifted them the garments that they wore when they entered uh, Medina. It, and so he went back to Mecca after that, uh, that uh, trip and he sold whatever he needed to sold, sell and he then brought his family and also the family of Abu Bakr. So Aisha and Abdul Rahman, they came with Talha because remember Talha is basically their uncle from the same tribe, not the first uncle but you get the point. Essentially he's a, a, an uncle of the family, right? So he's the one who brings Aisha and he's the one who brings uh, 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 Abdul Rahman, and he's the one who also brings his mother and others uh, in the Hijrah to Medina. And when they arrive in Medina, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made him a brother to one of the most elite of the Ansar, Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Abu Ayyub al Ansari and Talha then become the Mu'akha. Remember the Mu'akha, and. Uh, the Prophet allowed him to choose his plot of land uh, around the masjid. So Talha had a relatively close house because the Prophet allowed him to basically choose his uh, location of the house. Now, Talha uh, did not participate in the battle of Badr physically, yet he is considered a Badri. There are very few people such as Uthman, Talha is another example, where for whatever reason, and we'll explain right now, they didn't actually fight, but they're considered Badri. And they got a share of the ghanima. And they got the reward of the battle, even though they were not on the battlefield. How so? So as we remember, the story of, the, of Badr was that the Prophet and the Sahaba initially wanted to catch the caravan of Abu Sufyan. Correct? Wanted to catch the caravan. And 
the Prophet ﷺ was not intending to meet the Quraysh. He didn't want the thousand people to, he didn't even know. Remember, they found out the last day. Correct? Remember? They literally found out a few days before. Now, well, now what do we do? Do we attack? Do we not? So before they found out, and they're still trying to hunt down the caravan, the Prophet ﷺ sent two trustworthy people to go find the whereabouts of the caravan and then come back and report, then we can go and attack. And the person that was sent was Talha ibn Ubaidillah, along with another Sahabi. So Talha was sent on a scouting expedition. And in fact, Talha did track the caravan down. And he rushed back to try to basically tell them, oh, they're taking a different road, because remember, that was the whole point, right? So Talha figured out they're taking a different road. He's trying to get back in time, but obviously, by the time he gets back, Badr's over. Okay? Badr's over, and obviously, you understand there's no communication, there's no cell phone, there's nothing. So, what can be done? So, Talha radiallahu an misses the actual battle, but on the same time, he's clearly a part of the army. In fact, he played a very instrumental role. He was sent on a very dangerous expedition. And therefore, when he returned, the Prophet ﷺ considered him a Badri and gave him his share of the Ghanima as if he had participated fully. Because he's a part of the army in the end of the day. He left his home and he wanted to go and fight and he wanted to get, but he wasn't able to do that. Uh, and so the Prophet ﷺ gave him his share of the Ghanima. And when he gave him the share, Talha said, And how about my Ajr, Ya Rasulullah? Do I get my Ajr? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, your Ajr as well. You get it all. You get the ghanima and you get your ajr as well. Now, Talha radiallahu anhu, what he really, yani what clearly raised him above the ranks of every other person, really is the battle of Uhud. Talha is associated with the battle of Uhud. That is where Talha radiallahu anhu rose up and did what no other sahabi did. And that's Qadr Allah, they weren't there the way that Talha was. And Talha demonstrated his iman on the uh, battlefield of Uhud and essentially what happened at Uhud was that Talha radiallahu an was the senior most sahabi who never ever uh, left the side of the Prophet throughout the entire day even Abu Bakr was not able to find the Prophet he never left the Prophet but you know in the heat of the battle then the Prophet went and Abu Bakr could not find him for some period. And Abu Bakr had to redouble back and go find him. So the person there was with the Prophet a small group of people. And the senior most Sahabi that was with him constantly throughout the day was none other than Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And that's where the ranks of Talha rose up. That the, the sheer quantity of wounds and stabs and, 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 and basically lacerations that he achieved uh, essentially almost brought him to the verge of death and paralyzed his hand for the rest of his life. And he had actually a few digits, we don't know how many, at least as much research as I couldn't find out how many, but either a finger or more were cut off. So he was missing a finger. And on top of that, well, I'm jumping the gun. Let's get to, uh, so we're getting the effects of Uhud. So what happened at Uhud? So Uhud... Talha was with the Prophet ﷺ continuously from the very beginning of when Khalid ibn Walid attacked back all the way to the end. Talha was there. And in a Tirmidhi, we learned that when the Prophet ﷺ was forced to basically turn his back and, and face uh, uh, and find protection in the mountains, he is climbing up the mountains. And in a Sunan al Tirmidhi, we have the hadith here, I can quote it directly, but it is there in Tirmidhi, that they came across a place where in order to get to that cave, the, there was no opening, and the rock to climb was too high to climb. And Talha then went down on his hands and knees. And the Prophet ﷺ stood up on him to get to that level. Because you know, you, you imagine you're climbing a mountain, right? So Talha literally stood down like this, and the Prophet ﷺ got on his back to get to that higher level, and they continued uh, onwards. And the Prophet ﷺ said at this uh, point, Aujaba Talha. Talha is now wajib. Yani the, the, what Talha is doing, awjaba Talha, it is now wajib. And uh, Talha as well, it is narrated that when they got to that, uh, that cavern, that cave, we, we know, and I mentioned this in the Battle of Uhud, we did this, there were at least 11 of the Ansar, 
and Talha and a few more. We don't know their names. And these 11 Ansar uh, and Talha, when a contingent from Khalid ibn al-Walid's forces came, the Prophet said, who is going to take care of them? And Talha stood up and said, me. And the Prophet said, sit down. So another Ansari said, I will do it. So he went out and he kind of deflected, protected, and they went on and then he was killed. Then another group comes, because remember they're in that little cave and they're trying to, to basically make sure nobody sees them in that cave. Right? You all went over the battle of Uhud. And another one goes out. Once again, Talha says, I'll be the one. The Prophet says, no, sit down. Another one. And we learn 11 of that small entourage, one after the other, they defend and they meet their fate. And until finally, Talha is the one that is left. And the Prophet said, okay, go Talha now. And so Talha fights the fighting of all 11. That's the, the, what the narrator says. He fought the fighting of all 11. And it was in that fighting that essentially his entire body was wounded. That um, he had a stab uh, that came uh, to his hand, a sword, that, sorry, that came to his hand, and it cut off either one digit or more. He had multiple lacerations until finally when, uh, oh, oh, let me quote you the Adid Bukhari, sorry, before I get there, that when Talha was fighting uh, in this particular incident right now, uh, and a sword came down and cut off that finger, as we said, and Talha said, Hiss. We said this in, in, the, in the lecture that I gave so many years ago. He said, Hiss. And hiss is the Arabic equivalent of ouch. It's like ouch. I mean, hiss is like that. And the Prophet said, if you had just said Bismillah right now, the angels would have lifted you up even as the Quraysh are watching. Like you've reached such a high maqam right now, if you had just said Bismillah, rather than a word that's not good but not bad, it's just a generic word, right? Then angels would have lifted you up even as the Quraysh are even as the Quraysh are looking. And uh, Talha was also of those who they gave a special bay'ah amongst themselves on that day that we will fight until death. Now the Arabs had this custom and the Muslims early Islam in the time of the Prophet they took the custom uh, and in fact it is known even to this day amongst army people and whatnot that they basically give an oath to themselves that you know what we're not going to go back defeated we'll either win or we'll die. This is the oath of death. And on the day of Uhud, an elite group of Sahaba gave that oath of death. Talha was amongst them. That, khalas, this is it. Either we die or we're going to be victorious. There is no third opportunity or ground for us. So Talha was of those who uh, did that oath. And in Bukhari it is mentioned uh, that uh, Qais ibn Hazm says, I saw the hand of Talha become paralyzed on the day of Uhud, protecting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, Qais ibn, Hazm, ibn Abi Hazm says, on the day of Uhud, his hand became paralyzed. And he could not raise his hand when he gave the bay'ah uh, to Uthman uh, uh, and to Ali as well. He literally had to take his left hand and lift up the right hand and put it on. Okay, so his hand could not even be lifted anymore because of the wounds of that um, day. And Aisha reports that whenever the battle of Uhud was mentioned, Abu Bakr would say, that is a day that belongs to Talha, all of it. That is a day Talha is our hero. So Abu Bakr is saying that Talha is the hero of the battle of Uhud. And Abu Bakr narrates that I was the first person to come back to the process, and meaning I was the first to find him. Talha didn't have to find him because he was with him. I was the first to double back and find the Prophet ﷺ. And as soon as I came to the Prophet ﷺ, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Go take care of Talha. Subhanallah. Go take care. Even though the Prophet ﷺ himself was injured and bleeding. He himself was there. But Talha was one hair's width away from death. Talha was, there was a fear he would be gone. That's how serious. So as soon as Abu Bakr came, the Prophet said, go take care of Talha. Right? And, of course, Abu Bakr is not going to take care of Talha until he takes care of the Prophet. Correct. So he took care of the Prophet, did what he could. Then they went and they went to the body of Talha uh, that was lying there. And Abu Bakr said that he had akthar min sab'een, more than 70 wounds on his body front and back 70 injuries on one day and 
uh, his finger had been cut off. So again, we get this notion that a sword had come and there was basically the finger had been uh, cut off. And in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, in a hadith reported by the Prophet uh, that, uh, that, sorry, in a hadith that the Prophet said, not that, that the Prophet said, I remember on the day of Uhud, a time came when all I could see was Jibreel on my right hand side and Talha on my left hand side. There was nobody left. We just mentioned everybody had died from the Ansar. So there was a time, the only person I could see, Jibreel and Talha, that were protecting me. And so, in the day, on the day of Uhud, and of course we also learned that um, Talha as well was shielding the body of the Prophet from arrows. Right? Uh, and that is more than one person. Sa'ad as well did this, but Talha as well did this, right? So Talha as well was one of, one of those who is shielding the body, and that is why there were uh, wounds on the front and on the back. Because whatever he's trying to do, whenever he tries to see something, whatever he can do, he's putting his body between what's coming and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is why there are so many 70 wounds. So, because... Uh, the battle of Uhud wounded him so severely. Allah knows best, this is my analysis. We don't find anything after the battle of Uhud of him doing, he participated, means his list, his name is on the list. But we don't have any specific deeds. And that makes complete sense. His hand is not, his right hand, you cannot do anything with it. So he's physically there, he's doing whatever can be done, but he's not at the forefront, he can't be. He's now, I mean, what is the term? I don't want to say disabled, but you get the point. I mean, he's not... Slightly handicapped, even the word handicapped, I don't know, is he fully handicapped, you get the point. He's like, he cannot be at the forefront anymore because of the battle of Uhud. Nonetheless, he actively participates, let's put it this way, in every single other battle. And he dons the armor and he goes to the battlefield, but we don't have specific incidents and it's understood why we don't because he could not be at the uh, forefront. So he's at the battle of Khandaq, he's at the conquest of Mecca, he's at the treaty of Hudaybiyah, his name is in all of these. But um, as far as I could research, we don't have any specific incidents coming from it. And again, this makes complete sense that his bravery is not going to stop him from going, but at the same time, he should not be at the forefront anyway because that's not the best worry at this point in time because of what happened to him at uh, Uhud. And so uh, we, we learned that Talha did not uh, miss any battle of the Prophet ﷺ, even Badr, he is considered to be a part of Badr, despite the fact that he didn't actually uh, participate. Uh, and then during the time of the Khulfa al-Rashidun, uh, Talha was the one who when Abu Bakr was dying, uh, and he went to each and or every Sahabi call was called to him. Talha was also called and he said, what do you think of Umar al-Khattab? Talha was the only one who was brave enough and clear enough and, and, and frank enough to say, have you considered, O oh Abu Bakr, what will you say when Allah asks you about the strictness of Umar? And look at even the question, subhanAllah. He's not even saying, don't put Umar, he's too strict. Rather, he is saying, do you have an answer to this question? That when Allah will ask you, you appointed Umar and you knew he was strict, right? What will you say? And he was on his deathbed. Abu Bakr got up and he said, I will say back to Allah that, O oh Allah, I put the person that I trusted the most of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu in charge. It means I know I'm going to have this response ready. So what the fact, the point for us is the frankness of Talha. And who other than Talha could be so frank and blunt that he's not against Umar, astaghfirullah. But he's saying, oh Abu Bakr, are you sure because of this one characteristic? So the only person who was that brave and that frank and had that, the, the, the standing to actually say this is Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And then during the time of, of uh, Umar, of course, as well, uh, Talha plays a role amongst the viziers. Basically, these group of Sahaba, they're like the advisory committee. You know, there's no parliament, there's no, but what the closest we'll have to an advisory committee. Talha is of the, let's call it the inner circle of Umar al-Khattab. When Umar passes away, of course, Talha is in the uh, six, as Umar says, that these are the six people the Prophet died, and he was pleased with all of them, and I know all of them. So these are the six, he's in the six, and as we all know that within uh, uh, a day, these six came down to three, because each one nominated somebody that they would rather have, and Talha was the first one to get out. And Talha uh, was the first to get out, and uh, he narrated, uh, sorry, he nominated Uthman ibn Affan. 
Okay, so Talha nominated Uthman ibn Affan and he said, I don't want it anymore. Then it was Uthman Ali and Abdurrahman ibn Auf, remember, right? And then Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, Would you agree if I get out that I will decide between the two of you? And then, you know, three days went by. Okay, but the point is, Talha was of the first, the first to say, I don't want it. You can have it, Uthman, have my share, and I'm out. And the same happened with the three others. So, um, Talha was the one who nominated uh, Uthman. However, and we mentioned this in the time of Uthman's lecture that I gave, he became mildly critical of some of the policies of Uthman towards the end of Uthman's life, radiallahu anh. Okay? So, Talha, radiallahu an disagreed with some of the policies of Uthman, and perhaps at the beginning, when it wasn't clear what was going to happen, Perhaps he was maybe physically in the crowd when Uthman could still come to the masjid and when it was like a negotiation. Once the crowd became rowdy and violent, Talha went away. So Talha was definitely not a part of anything that happened physically. But unfortunately, because of the association from the beginning, this kind of left a bitter taste in the uh, Umayyads, early Umayyads, okay? Because Talha, radiallahu an, was of those who mildly criticized in the beginning, and he sympathized with some of the complaints. But then, as we said, remember, remember in the beginning, the uh, the, the the complainers gathered in the masjid. He spoke to them. Uthman spoke to them directly. Perhaps Talha was in that first gathering, let's say. But once the siege began, Talha has nothing to do with this at all. And no Sahabi participated, much less Talha, in the, uh, in the spiraling out of events that took place. But nonetheless, this is what happens, unfortunately, when tongues wag and people talk and whatnot. So he was kind of sort of linked with them, even though he did not actually have a part in the uh, actual uh, um, physical, uh, if you like, um, uh, uh, blockade, blockage of the house, much less with the actual killing of Uthman. And therefore, when Uthman radiallahu an was massacred, Talha felt immensely guilty. The guilt was massive in him. And that is why, eventually, what did he do? He was one of those, along with Zubair, who went to Mecca to visit Aisha when she had not come back from Hajj. And then all of them said, we can't continue like this. Six, seven, eight months have gone by. We need to march to Basra. We need to find our support in the people of Basra. And we need to, as a group, as a, as a large, you know, basically group of people, I don't want to call it an army because we said the intention was never to fight Ali, that we will demand, our voice will be heard, that Uthman's, uh, radiallahu anhu's killers is going to be brought to uh, justice. And so, uh, Talha radiallahu anhu, uh, it is narrated that on the day of the Battle of Camel, he basically said something similar, that, you know, um, uh, I didn't defend Uthman the, the way that I should have, but today I will defend him the way that I should. So this clearly shows that Talha radiallahu anhu was not sympathetic to the crowd that went beyond what is acceptable. As we said, it is acceptable to disagree with the policies of the Sahaba that's not beyond the pale of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? You can agree or disagree. And Talha disagreed with some of the policies of Uthman, so be it, okay? We're allowed to disagree. But obviously when the situation spiraled out of control, Talha had nothing to do with that, but still he felt guilty. That for whatever thing that he was, I mean, and again, to be honest, we don't even know what role or whatever, how much yani, he was, but nonetheless, in the beginning of the siege, sorry, not the siege, in the beginning of the crowds coming, Talha radiallahu anhu was associated with them. There is an assumption that maybe those crowds used his name more than they should have. You know what it happens, you know, like my support and whatnot. Allah knows best. So, um, we know that Talha and Zubair, of course, were on the side of Aisha in the Battle of the Camel. And a few weeks ago, or two weeks ago, I mentioned what happened. And that is that uh, Ali radiallahu anhu sent a message, and specifically to Talha and Zubair, that look, you know, this is not appropriate, We're not, we shouldn't be fighting and whatnot. And so Talha and Zubair, they both agreed that there should not be war. 
And when uh, the people began to draw their swords, Talha radiallahu an uh, was on his horse and he was running back and forth in his own army, in his own group, saying, put your swords back, we're not going to be fighting, put your swords back. And as he was doing that, an arrow comes and uh, there was a place in the armor that uh, was weak and there was an opening and the arrow was aimed for that and these are people, I don't know, subhanAllah, it's just really amazing to think about this but that's how they were back then, that was their sharpshooting of the, of the era and so the arrow comes and pierces him and he dies essentially on the spot uh, on, the battle, on the day of the battle of the camel and he was uh, 62 or some say 64 years old so 62 or 64 years old and it is mentioned that Ali radiallahu an, when the battle was over, he held up the body of Talha and he began to wipe the dust from the face of Talha. And he said, Ilallahi ashtaki, I complain to Allah of our situation, of my situation. Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasya mansiya, which is in the Quran. How I wish I, I never lived to see this day. How I wish I never saw what I'm seeing, that I have to see the body of Talha being killed in this um, manner. And... It is mentioned that uh, Talha's son uh, entered in upon Ali radiallahu an after the battle was over and Ali welcomed him, embraced him, hugged him and said, I make dua to Allah, I pray that your father and I are amongst those whom Allah has said in the Quran, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِم مِّن غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرِرٍ مُتَقَابِلِينَ that we are of those whom Allah says in the Quran, we have removed the animosity from their hearts and they are in Jannah facing one another on couches. And again, this is what we expect of the Sahaba. There are some modern narrators and commentators and, and wa'adh and khutaba who sugarcoat to the point of ridiculousness that there was no animosity. There no, clearly was. Wars took place. People died. You know, especially between Ali and Muawiyah and Aisha, even there was radiallahu anhu ajma'in. But this is what we expect. There are others who make the animosity bigger than it was. This is what we expect. So what if there was some not getting along? Wallahi, as I've said so many times, no matter how righteous and pious you are, I am, and none of us is, is that righteous like the Sahaba at all, but still, no matter how good a person is, you don't get along with everybody, do you? You, there are personal issues that take place, you know. There are people that you just don't like and other people like that person. You don't like that person. That's how life is, right? So the Sahaba are actually no different. But they didn't make these differences personal. And they understood that, look, we disagreed. There are some issues in our hearts. But look at what Ali radiallahu is saying. That I am optimistic that your father and me are what Allah says in the Quran. That we are both in Jannah and we're going to be facing one another and we have nothing of enmity in our hearts. So Talha radiallahu an, he passed away on the battle on the day of the battle of the camel and therefore he was buried essentially in what is now the city of Basra outside but now it is inside the city of Basra and his grave has remained a well-known place to this day and in fact um, the Iraqi government built a masjid uh, basically on the grave and then when this uh, ISIS group took over what do you think they did to that masjid? They blew it up. So that masjid was blown up uh, but the grave is well known. The grave is well known. Where Talha's grave is it is known to um, this day. Um, now Talha radiallahu anh, some final points about him. Talha radiallahu anh, did not narrate that many ahadith. In fact probably less than 20 are narrated from Talha. Very little. And this is to be expected from multiple ways. Firstly, he himself felt very hesitant uh, to narrate from the Prophet ﷺ. Secondly, not every Sahabi was associated with hadith narration and knowledge. Some Sahaba are into this, some Sahaba are into that. And we have to expect this, as we have said many times, that not every person is exactly the same. So, what Khalid ibn al-Walid is known for is not hadith narration. What Abu Huraira is known for is not battlefield tactics. But the Ummah needs Khalid and Abu Huraira. And each one has a role to play. So Talha radiallahu an, even though he lived until the time of Ali radiallahu an, he was not associated with hadith narration. And he was a very, it seems he was a, a relatively quiet person as well. And uh, he was not of those to basically uh, have hadith uh, circles. Uh, Talha as well in terms of his family, 
as is typical, he had, mashallah, tabarakallah, many, many children. Uh, as is typical, again, for the time, he married many, many women. And again, and it's very common in those days, as we know, so many of the Sahaba, they would marry, divorce, marry. It was, it was very common back then. So Talha married at least nine women in his life, at least nine women, if not more. And uh, what's very interesting, as one of the early scholars said, is that four of these women were sisters to our mothers. They were sister-in-laws of the Prophet Sallallahu Right? So Talha being such a senior Sahabi from a senior tribe of the Quraysh and also as will come to wealthy as well. So four of his wives were sister-in-laws of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I don't know of any other Sahabi that had this uh, privilege. So of them is Umm Kulthum binti Abi Bakr, who is of course sister is Aisha. So Aisha's younger sister Umm Kulthum, he married. Of them is Hamana bint Jahsh, who is the sister of Zainab bint Jahsh. Of them is Fari'a bint Abi Sufyan, who is the sister of Umm Habiba Ramla bint Abi Sufyan. And of them is Ruqayya, the sister of Umm Salama. Okay, so Aisha, Zainab, Umm Habiba, Umm Salama, all of their sisters were wives of Talha. Ibn Ubaidillah, okay? And from these multiple women, not just these four, but all of his wives, he had at least 11 sons and four daughters. So a total at least of 15, if not more, at least 15 children. And subhanAllah, something very, uh, very beautiful. He loved to name his children by the names of the prophets. So when you look at the books of Tariq and the books of... Um, uh, they're called the Tarajim of the Sahaba, the biographies of the Sahaba. So his sons are Muhammad, Musa, Ya'qub, Ismail, Ishaq, Zakariya, Yusuf, Yahya, Isa, and on and on. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. So he loved to name his children the names of the Sahaba. So, uh, sorry, the names of the Prophets. So essentially all of his children are named after the uh, Prophets. And uh, finally, Talha radiallahu an was of the wealthiest companions and also of the most generous. He was extremely wealthy, rivaling Uthman ibn Affan, and he was extremely generous as well, rivaling Uthman ibn Affan. But Uthman of probably preceded him in his generosity, but maybe Talha was richer than Uthman, maybe. And again, who is going to calculate that? But Talha was definitely of the wealthiest of the Sahaba, and at times he would dress according to his wealth. One of the Tabirun reported that he once saw Talha wearing a garment that was worth at least a thousand dirhams. At least a thousand dirhams. And another Tabiri said, I do not know of anyone whom money comes to easier without any effort like Talha. Money just comes to Talha. And along with this wealth, there was generosity, the likes of which as well are legendary. In one uh, narration, Sa'ad, uh, Ibn Sa'ad in his tabaqat, he mentions one particular incident that caused Talha to donate in one night all the wealth that was in his house. And somebody asked, how much was it at that time? So he responded, not, not Talha, but the, the servant who did it, 400,000 dirhams in one night. 400,000 dirhams were given in one night. And one year when the people of Medina were facing a food crisis, Talha single-handedly purchased grain for the entire city of Medina and fed the whole city from his wealth. So when Allah Azza wa Jal gives and you are that generous, what's going to happen? Allah will give you much more. And that's what we see in the life of Talha. That literally, and subhanAllah, when you look at the ideal, so money is coming to them. Literally, we can say that people like Talha were the equivalents of multimillionaires. But you can see that their heart is not attached to the money. You can see it in their lives and in their generosity. And this is the epitome of iman and taqwa and of richness. Have all the money, but your heart is not attached to that money. And it is also uh, mentioned that uh, when he passed away, uh, they couldn't calculate the number of wealth that he has, and according to one, it was a hundred of a hundred thousand coins, like we would say like a million or ten million coins, right? And he had hundreds of properties and wells. So this is quite literally what we would call a multimillionaire. To own properties and wells and hundreds of hundreds of thousands of coins. 
This is something that, يعني, think about that. But at the same time, one of the most famous tabi'un, Sa'ib ibn Yazid, he said, I accompanied Talha while he was traveling and in his house. I was with him. And I never even heard of anybody who was more generous than him in wealth. He would give money and clothes and food like no one else. So this is a very famous tabi'i, a sabi Yazi. Everybody knows him who knows hadith. He's a very famous narrator. And he narrates from Talha and other uh, sahaba. And he goes, I never even heard of somebody more generous. Like literally, wherever he'd go, he's giving money and food and clothes. He's not just generous with money. Whatever he has, he's sharing with, with other people. So this is Talha ibn Ubaidillah. Uh, and this is honestly pretty much all that we know about him. Very else little is left other than to quote some hadith or whatnot. But really, this is all that we know about Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And definitely one of the people that we should now memorize his name. One of the Ashara Mubashara, a person whom we admire immensely and, and, and greatly respect. Um, just a quick footnote. And not that we care, but we should just know that the other group, the non-Sunni group, unfortunately their stance towards him is the exact opposite as our stance. And that is because Talha was on the side of Aisha fighting against Ali. And so, uh, astaghfirullah, we should just know this. From their perspective, he is not even a Muslim. So they say that particular Sahaba are not Muslim. And of them is Talha because he was on the other uh, side. And this is an exaggeration in the, in the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And look at how different Ali radiallahu anh is from those who claim to be his followers and his Shia. Look at the difference of Ali and those who claim to be his followers. Ali radiallahu himself holds the body of Talha and he wipes the dust from his face and he says, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha. And he says, I wish I had never had to see this day. And when Talha's son comes, he goes, I am positive, inshallah, arju. It means I'm optimistic that your father and me will be in Jannah together. And the people who think they are partisan of Ali, their view is the exact opposite of Ali radiallahu anh. And that is why I keep on saying, we are the true Shia to Ali and Shia to Hussein. I say this over and over again. We are the ones who give them the respect they deserve. And we believe in them the way they deserve to be believed in. And we follow their perspective even of the Sahaba. Because they did not make takfir of any of the Sahaba. Even Ali and Muawir Allah did not make takfir of one another. So we are the ones who truly support and follow um, them. And we are the people who love all of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah with that we will conclude for today. And then next week Inshallah we'll do uh, the Hawariyu Rasulillah, the disciple and the, 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 the one who protected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. Inshallah with that we break for uh, Salah. Oh, one point about our halaqa. So the, the Tuesday halaqa. The Tuesday halaqa, uh, I have been advised and I agree with this 100% that it should not be on Tuesdays. And that is because it is difficult for many of you to come. And we know from our experiences as well that um, we don't get a large group on Tuesdays. Rather, what has been advised, and I completely agree, we should scrap the Tuesday format. And rather, once a month we have a half day Saturday. And we intensively study whatever I wanted to do over six weeks of Tuesday, one hour each. We basically do an entire half day and then we continue another Saturday of another month. So inshallah ta'ala, that is what we're going to be doing. Uh, that um, probably uh, the second or third week of October, we'll get an uh, email advertisement. Inshallah, we'll be doing uh, an intensive halaqa all day Saturday, inshallah. As for the topic, then will be decided uh, in the next few days, inshallah. Oh, go ahead. Bismillah. Sorry. <laughs> For all four Khalifas. So, this was the list that you provided, have the four names. The top four are the same in both the lists. But that wasn't relevant in the selection of the caliphs. Because so, I'll answer your second one first. Um, actually, some narrations of the hadith mention Uthman and then Ali, and some mention Ali, then Uthman. But even 
even then the selection was the Umar selection, if it was known that this would be the sequence of the That's Umar. because the, the Sahaba did not think that the hadith was any sequence. Exactly. That's what I was saying. Yeah. They didn't assume the hadith implied a sequence. So they didn't use it in this process. As for your question about Najashi, so again, there are people whose assumption is that indeed they are in Jannah, but nothing explicit has been narrated, right? So the fact that the Prophet prayed over Najashi and he said, he is your brother in faith, clearly it's there. But the explicit wording that Najashi is in Jannah has not been narrated. So he doesn't get that status as the rest of the Sahaba, Abu Bakr for Jannah, wa Umar for Jannah, wa Uthman for Jannah, Ali. That, that is for the Ashra of Bashar. The people who are not amongst the ten, but in there, or there were indications that they are going to Jannah, even after the death, you mentioned these different categories. So we call them Mubasharun bil Jannah. Yeah. But we don't say the Ashra Mubashara. As I said in the beginning, the Ashra Mubashara are a separate category. But the Mubasharun are more than Ashra. So we call them all Mubasharun bil Jannah, inshaAllah.